thank you very much. Right. So the long topic of the conversation or of my speech, I don't um, remember what was there. But the point is, is that I know you guys are here not to read, not to you know listen for the boring stuff. So I actually wanted to make it uh, a little bit more fun. And I wanted to start with just uh, you know one simple statement that I think is pretty bold and aggressive maybe to most of us here because the only reason why you're here today is because you're already in crypto. So the statement is, I believe that we are all working on a very big sandbox. So we can do amazing things. Like in three years, in four years of, you know, since the inception of you know, real DeFi there, or DeFi 1.0, we've uh, replicated almost every single existing traditional financial primitive. And now people are going even beyond that. But um, you know, how do we even how do we even use this? Like, how, how do you guys uh, how do you guys even like move your money from crypto to like into crypto? Like, isn't that really really I don't know stupid in a sense? Have you ever thought about it's really all just about exchanging asset A to fiat B or you know fiat B to asset C or whatever it is? It's just literally that plain simple. You can have the most sophisticated MAV strategy, you can have this, you know, really, um, you know, CVX, CRV, you know, like Frax people on Tree Crypto, whatever it is, like on your chain. But like, how do you, how do you, how do you actually use this? How do you pay, you know, how do you pay rent? How do you pay for your gas in the gas station? How do you even buy coffee? Like all of that is pretty, you know, stupid. I keep repeating this word, but I really want it to get in your head because uh, let's just take a look at like how the typical on-ramping looks and even this term on-ramping it, it feels like there's some sort of obstacle that we have to like on-ramp onto it to like get into it like in our mindset we're actually thinking that we are some sort of like isolated from the rest of the world so let's take a look what do you have you have a bank account maybe you even have like a credit card a debit card so you have some euros um, I would assume most of you guys are, you know, locally based, um, some are not, but ultimately let's say you have some fiat. So what do you do next? Well then, you open an account on a crypto exchange and then uh, you have to wire your euros to that crypto exchange. Um, a funny thing is, I opened my Twitter today and I got uh, probably like, you know, with a geolocation obviously targeted ad, and it was uh, like in Polish, uh, but I, you know, translated it and it was something like, you know, when the next bull market starts, you know, make sure that you can have some USDTs, you know, like to buy some of those shit coins. And, you know, like, uh, and then I was like, all right, well, let's take a look. And then it's like a Telegram chat with like an OTC desk that tells me like, okay, we can onboard you and then you wire funds to us and then we'll give you USDT. I'm like, Jesus, like that's exactly the perfect use case for me here. So you wire your funds and then what do you do? Well, an exchange has a number of assets, right? So um, it's practically impossible for a large exchange to support long tail assets, so they support only a few or handful or maybe a bit more. Um, say hello to Binance Innovation Zone, right? But um, once you get some tokens, then uh, what do you do? Well, I want to get into DeFi, like that promised land. I want to do something with my money because, well, what can you do on exchange? You want to trade. All right, what if I want to gamble, but I want to gamble something with more sophisticated? Well, then I will have to wire my tokens to my non-custodial wallet. One more thing, right? Well, I have a wallet, but now I need this thing gas. Like, Jesus, like, how, how easy it is that you are making it for me. So I also have to remember that, all right, I want to have some gas as well if the token is not native on that network. Then I need to wire all of that to my uh, non-custodial wallet. Then I connect that non-custodial wallet to the actual dApp that I want to use. And then whatever the DAP actually allows me to do, then I need to execute that into my, you know, in, in my wallet. So that is just like all of that is just for me to, you know, have easier access for me to lose my money on whatever I want to lose it on. How do how does the how does the off ramping look like? Well, it looks exactly the same, but in reverse. You have to use multiple platforms. You have to use multiple um, well services just to use that money on and off. And that's why I believe that DeFi is mostly a sandbox. And it doesn't mean that DeFi is bad. It's just that the rails, the connection, even the terms that we use are really primitive. And that is, you know, pun intended, right? Like, how do we use those primitives in the real world? Well, what if I could tell you is that, what if you could remove all of that middle connection? What if you could just say, you know what? What if the wallet, 
that allows me to have all of this composability and you know, lose my money really easy across all of the you know, crypto, what if it can be connected to my bank account? What if it could actually control my bank account? What if for me, as the user, there'll be really no difference between mo like moving money in and out? Is it, you know, is it really possible? I think it is, obviously. But um, if we look into, let's imagine, let's just imagine that you know, one day this is possible. Somehow your wallet, your non-custodial wallet can actually control your bank account. What kind of things would you do? Because this is the problem with the crypto, right? We're building infrastructure for billions and billions of users to come in and somehow they never come. And then we ask ourselves, well, you know, it's, it's not that they're stupid, right? Like, you know, it's not, you know, something's definitely not right. But then you figure out, well, it's because we haven't actually built the applications for other people to use it. Something that, well, they would want to use it for. So there has to be some sort of benefit. When we're talking about financial stuff, well, what kind of things would be beneficial for, for the users? Here's just one example. Um, and, you know, arbitrary names, but ultimately, what if you could easily have that over collateralized loan to take a, you know, like a pay off your car lease? Um, as easy as you know, a couple of clicks, because that's something that, in this case, Alchemix as a platform allows me to do. But then again, I still have to follow all the steps that we've walked through in order for me to actually pay for that car lease. But then, what if you could do that right away? What if you could have your true DeFi savings account? So there's something that pays off yield. Doesn't matter if it's real or not. You don't really care, right? What you care for is that when that Netflix subscription comes in on your card doesn't bounce so that the next time you know the new series is up you're like oh damn I have to you know top up my card to sort of like pay for it what if there was a way a programmatic way for that yield to pay for that transaction on the card and not the principal so you never really touch the principal it always yields you pay off the yield and that's that what if uh, oh this is cool yeah liquidity uh, liquidity is amazing um, what if you could actually pay with your ETH for your rent without spending your ETH, right? Take a look at liquidity from a reverse perspective. What if it's not really the LUSD that you're looking for, but it's what LUSD unlocks? What if you want to keep an exposure in ETH, but you don't want to sell it, but you still need to pay for your bills? And that's just one of the ways. Well, why not take a loan, mint LUSD, pay with that um, you know, for your monthly rent or whatever it is, and still keep an exposure in ETH? So if you close the trove, Again, all these different terms, but ultimately, you can still have access back to your ETH if you pay back the loan. There's many more things. What if um, you could buy now, pay later on the card? So same thing, same concept, right? You can have some sort of asset, you can borrow against it, you immediately pay that when it comes to some sort of payment bill, etc., and then you can repay back that debt. Now, that is a primitive that is existing in traditional finance. That's a market on its own. It's called like BPNL, buy now, pay later. Same concept, but in a... And here's a, here's a point. It's not only a decentralized matter, but it's in a non-custodial matter. And there's a, there's a big difference in that. We can expand all of that. Um, I just took these logos. Maybe you uh, figure out some of them. Some of them are pretty dead now. So sorry about that. But um, ultimately, what it means is that there shouldn't be um, exclusivity. There shouldn't be that, well, this is the protocol that you know, is allowed to do that, this is the protocol that is not allowed to do that. There has to be the generalized solution. The problem with that is, is that, well, we in crypto, we love one thing. We love building standards. It's like, today, I'm going to build a new standard to manage all of the other 18 standards. And then, you know, like, you're yet creating the 19th standard to do something. So that when the 20th guy comes in, he's like, no, 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 that was all wrong. I'm going to do it the right way. This is something that's actually slowing down our momentum when it comes to the money lag that we've all been advertising. But nevertheless, the future that I see is something that would actually allow you, for you as a user, to pick and choose the service providers who can allow you to do something with your money. And depending on what exactly you're trying to do, it could be different things. Um, at this point, um, you know, I lied in the first slide, right? You know, you're not reading it, but ultimately, uh, I'll have to, you know, make you read this something. But you're wondering, like, how does it work or that? Um, I see I don't remember my own slides. But um, now here comes the boring part. Let's take a look and let's run through this quickly. 
what if you could connect all of that, I already spoke about that, um, there still has to be some sort of interconnection or there still has to be some sort of service. Well, um, the previous speaker already told about that. Well, there's a company that has to do something of that. Um, the company has to be, has to have the necessary licenses because you connect actually to the traditional existing financial marketplace. Um, and, um, you know, there has to be some sort of infrastructure on chain, all of that complicated, boring stuff. You know, there we go. Thank you very much. That was all that I wanted to tell you about. But, um, no, let's actually touch on the first part. So, we're not going to get into the existing traditional financial ecosystem. Why? Back in 2016 and 17, um, it, has anybody been in crypto in that era at that time? Like 2016, 17, quite a few. So you guys remember that um, at that time we had this big idea. What if every coffee shop on the planet would accept my you know, bitcoins natively, and we would all transact, we would all live in this, you know, utopia. Somehow it never happened. The problem with that is, is that that coffee shop owner never really wants to accept your crypto. Why? Because, well, they are counterparties. They want fiat. They have to pay salaries in fiat. They have to pay their taxes in fiat. They have to pay for those products in fiat, etc., etc. So what it means is that in those five years or six years, we started slowly shifting the momentum to, okay, what if I, as a user, want to pay in crypto, but then the merchant, that coffee shop owner, will accept fiat? So this is where you have these intermediaries, the layers that, you know, on the fly, convert crypto to fiat, et cetera, et cetera. Oh, no, guys, stay in. Please, no. No. I'm kidding. Blacklisted. You're not going to get the airdrop, guys. No, I'm kidding. Well, but... The cool part about this is that what you can really do is that you can actually tap into that ecosystem so you can work by its own rules, licenses, regulators, but you can do cool stuff on chain. So for example, this is the approach that we're taking to make sure that it can actually be accessible by all you know, other contracts, other chains, other networks. One thing that traditional finance does really, really well is called locking the users. Locking the users means that you lock your customer into your service, into your app, into your wallet, and it makes it really hard for the user to switch to something else. Now, regulators, everybody doesn't like them, but they actually made one really cool thing about Europe. So they started in the UK, now it's happening in Europe. It's basically open banking. So for example, you can bank with one bank, but then if you open an account with another one, you can still have access to your you know, previous account. That's not the case that is, you know, in, in crypto. But this approach, and this is where the you know, unintended chill comes in, what we allow you, anybody to connect in any of those six parts, and we can quickly touch base on that, that will allow you to actually work on one of, one of the possible ways on that on-chain settlement, or one of the possible legs of that on-chain settlement. Let's take a look at a quick example. Let's say you have, as we already spoke on the uh, centralized exchanges, right? So you have some fiat, you have some euros, you want to get into some uh, new shiny token. Well, the exchange would not be able to support that, so you need to go to DEXs, and then you need to swap into that DEX, um, you know, the token, whatever is available. What if you could do that on the fly? So what if the long tail asset can actually be swapped in an atomic transaction into the asset that you want to keep on the balance sheet, which is most likely something stable, so stable coin, something that can be settled, something that can be accepted on a balance sheet, does that. What if you have to uh, be able to prove that specific transactions can only occur with specific customers or specific counterparties? Um, this is where we're getting into this like gatekeeper stuff, right? Meaning that, uh, well, users in EU, they have one set of regulations, users outside, whereas elsewhere, they have different set of regulations, et cetera. Now, the third part, which is where, how does the actual settlement happen? Have you guys ever thought about this magic word settlement, right? So you have some crypto and there's some fiat there um, that will land on your card account, et cetera. Like, what does really happen? How does it really work? Well, it's actually plain, dumb, and simple. There's a company that uh, either has some processor involved or does it on its own, but basically it accepts the token in the balance sheet and then it spits out fiat. That's it. You know, you know those um, back from like what, probably like 90s or even 2000s. Uh, do you guys remember those uh, like pawn shops, like exchange things, right? So like small boxes, 
they would have those like USD, Euro, like uh, USD, JPY, whatever, like, you know, exchange rates. And they would have like, I don't know, five, 10% markup. Well, everything else in finance works exactly that way, literally. You have some assets, you know, like on one side, you have the other, you know, asset there, and you're just literally arbitraging between two things. So one, you know, person comes in to buy dollars, the other person comes in to sell euros, that's it, that's basically your working capital that you work with. Exactly the same way, every single trade desk, OTC desk, credit card uh, or crypto debit card provider works exactly the same way. The second part um, is that the settlement forwarder contract, this is where, again, you may need to involve multiple quarter parties. Um, this is where we get into an example. Have you guys ever tried to exchange that large sums of money through those like pawn shops like exchanges? So that, you know, the, the guy like in there in the, you know, in the box calls someone and then the guy in, like with a, you know, little suitcase comes into the box because they don't have enough money to give you, right? Well, this is exactly the same thing. What if you want to settle large sums of money? That's where, again, you may not have enough liquidity. So uh, that's exactly that. This is where you know, different quarter parties come in. The bridge contract. Here's a question. Um, have you guys ever bridged from one network to another network? Like, how many of you guys have ever tried it? Fantastic. Um, have you guys ever thought, why does it take so long? Like, it's never instant, right? It, there's always the delay. And depending on the network, there's like a different delay time. Um, how many of you guys have actually bridged from Polygon, for example? Quite a few. Have you ever wondered why it takes like up to 15 minutes for exchanges, for, you know, for even Circle to recognize its own token, you know, to be, you know, bridged to Circle? Well, that's basically something that's um, you know, called finality time. What it means is that you're not sure that something has actually happened or not. And that's not, you know, not the case with, um, oh, I guess I'm done. Sorry about that. Yeah, I guess that was too boring, right. Anyhow, um, what I mean by that is that we will never reach the point of, um, being able to use those primitives truly natively in the real world if we have all these, um, I would say, independent actors, right? All the L2s, L1s, uh, layer 3s, layer 4s, whatever it is, on different networks. So there has to be a something, a unified system that could accept that risk or that could work with different parties to make sure that we can actually, we as users, we can always transact on the network that we want to and then you, as a service, as a company, then you figure out how the hell you can get my money of that network. That is damn complicated, that is damn hard, and that is why right now, there's actually no single crypto debit card live that would allow you for that just-in-time funding, right? So from the money on your smart wallet, or crypto wallet, to your card instantly, without locking you on their own network. And that's an important part. So we, as an industry, at this point, still failed to make sure that there's a generalized solution for you to be able to do that. So yes, you can bridge now to my specific app chain, and then your transactions can be settled instantly, but then, you know, isn't, isn't that the whole point? Like, I don't wanna use your app chain. Like, I just wanna use my assets on the network where I am, and then I still wanna be able to use them. So this is still a big problem. And well, we, Again, and that's where I really don't want to talk about holy health. The point is, is that what we believe in is that the only way we in crypto can actually break through this sandbox and then allow us, ourselves, as users, to use our own crypto money in a more efficient way. So just give you like four examples of that. And the only way it is possible is through, well, generalized solutions where you do not force me to lock me into your smart wallet, which is non-custodial is to say, but ultimately, well, I can only use it with you. You do not need to bridge to your network where you know, my funds only work with your network. It has to be generalized. And until somebody is able to come up with that thing, well, um, none of it makes sense, even my speech today. But um, this, is, this is the least boring part. What I wanted to say is what we are working on is to make sure that what you as a user can do is you can have your finance 
controlled by your self-custody wallet. And with that, you're starting, right? It's just like a small dent. I saw a dent somewhere on the, you know, on the, on the name there. And, you know, we are that dent. And the entire, you know, name there is, is like the entire crypto. We're making the dent to make sure that at some point of time, what you will be able to do is you will be able to control 100% of the time the assets that you hold in your self-custody wallet while making every single transaction at the point of sale, so shop, gas station, wire, to make sure that it actually works um, you know, just in time. With that being said, everything has been said, but um, what I wanted to finalize my conversation or my talk with you guys today, and uh, you know, uh, I would say hopefully it wasn't boring, is that what we really need to think about and rethink the approach that we're taking. What I mean is, it's a message to you guys as participants of the industry, as builders. I would assume most of you work with um, you know, crypto companies and crypto projects, is that for the 100 people or 1,000 people that remain in DeFi today, you know, bear market, everything else, let's stop so-called like PVP, right? So let's stop fighting each other, who's right, who's wrong, Let's stop fighting over those thousand users that are still there for some reason, maybe because they're stuck or they lost their key so they cannot get out, and actually start thinking about how can we utilize what we've built together collectively, how all of that can work together to make sure that you know, the people that have never heard about your new network, new token, new protocol, new contract, how we can get to those users to be able to you know, let them use their money freely. Because ultimately, in the end, that's the only thing that matters. With that being said, thank you very much, guys. Um, and if you have any questions, let me know. Any questions before the lunch break? Hey, great talk. Um, do you think we can do better by skipping the card providers, which means that you, I know you mentioned that you know in the past we think we're gonna like transact natively on the blockchains so, or like Lightning networks or, or or anything like that. No, um, the reason the reason very simple is they have such a big influence already. Um, if you go into the rurest possible village in Africa, Visa, Mastercard is most likely going to be accepted. Um, so the problem with crypto is the distribution. And that's why when we started you know, making this approach to can the shop like, accept crypto natively, it failed just because who's gonna use crypto if I can only accept, you know, if I can only pay with crypto in like one shop somewhere you know, in a different country, in a different city. It has to be universally accepted. And then this is where the status quo comes in. Why would existing incumbents allow you to do you know, something that would you know, compete with them? Well, th this is why if you think if you look from the you know, card payment processors, well, Visa, MasterCard, Amex is probably the unique one, but everything else is state uh, endorsed, controlled, built. Uh, Union Pay, China. Um, Russian one, Mir, right? Whatever it is, it's state enforced because they have the authority to say, well, if you want to sell stuff in my country, you, know, you have to use this. And that's basically how it works. So the problem is, unless somebody comes up with enormous, immense amount of capital, to have such a big infrastructure to be able to support it universally, it's always gonna be this you know, like egg and chicken problem. Like, okay, well, we don't have enough points of sale, so nobody's gonna use it. So my approach is, let's not fight it, let's work with it, and well, then you can still provide the benefits to those that do want to use crypto, but for them without even having a notice or a dance, right, in that sense. Um, you know, we, we're, we're just like literally getting started, but I have my, I have my Apple Pay, so I can pay whatever I want to, but um, you know, that Apple Pay is funded with you know, my hot wallet, right, that's there on the phone, and you know, with the USDC that sits there. And that is just the base part, and it's still boring. What's gonna be really exciting is cool, is that when that USDC on my hot wallet is actually gonna do something with some other protocol, some other network, and then it's more exciting, because um, I'll give you just one example. It, maybe it's off topic, right? But, um, you guys all heard about this thing like treasury bills, right, T-bills. How many of you guys heard about this stuff? Quite a few, right? How many of you guys own T-bills? 
One, right? One, two, right? How easy was that process? So, like, me as just, like, retail customer, like, I maybe have, like, I don't know, N26, Revolut, whatever it is, right? Um, well, they now started offering me some, like, interest on, you know, my dollars, right? But then uh, it's pretty damn complicated. And then, you know, in crypto, I should be able to just, like, swap it in. It may not be redeemable because, you know, KYC, et cetera, all of that, that's a different part. But then it should be able, just like one click, I have it. And when that happens, that's, that's where I would like to switch to crypto, right? As just general user, because I just want my money grow. But it has to be stable, it has to be secure, so that we're not getting into, you know, another Luna Terra thing. So, but, anyhow. No, no, because we, we record. Uh, you mentioned about uh, banking unbanked. Uh, recently, I've been in Argentina, and I've been a little bit shocked by two things. Thanks. First, there is a discount uh, between physical dollars that they really like and dollars on chain. So. For me, it should be if if there is a this price difference, it should be another way around, because I cannot get any yield on physical dollars, and I can do a lot of things with dollars on chain, but they don't trust them. Second, all those guys who are exchanging uh, crypto, they use Tron, so you cannot do a lot. They don't using L2 or like another more sophisticated chains, they're using Tron. Um, I'll give you another example. Uh, quite often, and Ukraine is just, you know, just like literally next by, um, for you to redeem USDT Tron to local fiat currency, like Grivna, they pay you. So, you know, typically to off-ramp to fiat, you have to pay the fee, it's natural, right? There, they pay you, why? The question is that, well, because people want to flee the capital out of the country, so they lack that liquidity. And what, you know, the, the good example here is Argentina is going through a very volatile period. And then it comes to the clash of two things. One is, well, cash is, again, it's just mentally, it's the best thing. You know, if I have, you know, US dollar here in my pocket, it's worth way more mentally than whatever digital stuff there is. So there's still this huge gap in mentality, that's just one part of it. The second part of it, again, it's just how the economy works there. Who can get dollars into the country and out? So, exactly. Well, you have to have connections, right? Yeah, so, but that's, that's where this, like, this arbitrage comes in and you see this very obvious, clear arbitrage, but, and then you think, well, why nobody has arbitraged it? Well, because it's not an open market. And you know, that's basically why it's being created. So. Um, I'll give you another thing. I was thinking uh, the same way like, back, in, like um, back in the days and I wanted to have this huge mission, let's bank the unbanked. But then what I realized very quickly is that, well, majority of the people don't want that. Like it, it, they just not ready. Like you come in, you're this like cool guy and says, look guys, we you know, develop the thing that we think that you want, like go ahead and use it. And you know, the, the people out there are just like, why? Right? And then you're stumbling with that thing. Okay, well, sit down, right? Let's have a talk. This is why you want this. Um, and this is why I, I tried to switch the mentality from what if we start servicing the people that um, already need this? Or need this as in, you already have crypto. So you already understand this. For some reason, you already do this. So why I don't make your life better, right? Or easier, because you already use it. So for me as a company, it's cheaper, right? I don't have to sit down and talk to you. This is why it's cool, right? You're already on board it. And then as we progress, as we go, that's how you can expand and say, well, you know, my friends now use like Tron use the T, like why? Actually, I have no idea why. You know, a lot of it is like money laundering, et cetera, et cetera. But ultimately, you see, it's like that conviction point. Uh, like how many of you guys hate MetaMask? Like deep in your heart. And how many of you guys still use it? 
Huh? Huh? All right. So that's the conviction point, right? Once you like, once you start using it, it's really hard to get off it. Even though there's like other competitors, <laughs> there may be better wallets, but because it works, you kind of like you're still stuck with it. And and that's why it takes so much time to shift some sort of mentality. And most crypto startups are not long enough to even have a dent in that you know mentality shift. So everybody who has like big goals, ambitions to change something. <laughs> They have to realize it's going to take like years, years to build. And then are you going to be in those years? Well, that's a question, right? So that's why step by step. Um, sorry for taking so much of your time, guys. I know it's food time. Let's go get some food. <laughs> I have a question. Uh, One more question. OK. Yeah. Yep. One of the biggest countries is Poland. Um, uh, Europe. So we are live in EEA, so-called European Economic Area. Um, and that's to do with, again, licenses, right? So 